Hello and welcome to The Huddle. Liam Santa Maria back with you after another unbelievable round in the NBL, a double overtime classic, three of the three top high scoring individual performances of the season, a couple of wins for Melbourne and Adelaide, uh, and unfortunately, a couple more losses for the Brisbane Bullets. And that's where we're going to focus our conversation today, because joining me on the huddle, one of the key figures of the Bullets ownership group, all the way from the US of A, Jason Levian, co-managing partner for the Brisbane Bullets. So sit back, relax. Up next, Jason Levian. Jason, welcome to the huddle, mate. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Liam. Where in the world is Jason Levian right now? I understand you've just flown in and landed somewhere. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in the states in Washington D.C. Okay, that's your base. Yes. Awesome. Um, thanks heaps for coming on, mate. The Brisbane Bullets obviously have been a a massive talking point over the course of NBL 23. So much excitement coming into the season. A bit of a tumultuous a campaign thus far on and, and off the floor. So it's really great to be able to chat through uh, the team and the club and the season with you. Can I start by asking you what, what is and how would you describe your role within the organization? Well, Liam, that's a good question. For the last several years, I've been quite hands-off in my role. And even ownership collectively has been. Um, and um, what's happened is, um, I've decided to assume a, a more prominent role, a more uh, active role in the organization, along with my partner, Jake Silverstein, and the ownership group collectively, um, because we want to we want to drive home a vision for the club uh, that we think uh, is really possible and something that we can achieve. So this is sort of the beginning of ownership uh, being more proactive and being more involved. And that doesn't just include me, that includes my partners as well. Okay, great. I'm keen to dive into to the group as a, as a broader whole in a sec. But before we do that, let, let's get to know you a little bit more. What, what's your history within the industry? I understand you've had some experience as a, as a player agent, but also in managing and owning teams in big leagues and clubs around the world. Yeah, I, so I've been involved in professional sports for 25 years. Um, I started as a player agent representing primarily NBA players, um, as well as some other pro athletes. Um, my background was in basketball. I played uh, at a small college in the United States. Um, and then um, after representing players, I sold my, my, my agency uh, about 15 years ago and decided to work uh, in-house on the team side. I worked for the Sacramento Kings. Um, I put an investment group together that I was a part of. Uh, uh, to acquire the Philadelphia 76ers. I served on the board of the Sixers. Um, I then went and put an ownership group together to buy the Memphis Grizzlies. And I oversaw operations for the Grizzlies, both the business and the basketball side uh, for a few seasons. Um, and so that was my, that was my background for, for many years. Um, I, I then pivoted and got very involved in, in professional uh, soccer um, and acquired DC United with a partner, um, in um, 2012, um, and, and we built a stadium called Audi Field, which is in right downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, my partner, uh, my partners and I then acquired a, a, a professional soccer club uh, in the United Kingdom, Swansea City. Um, and my relationships in basketball, though, didn't leave me far away from this, the, 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 my love for the game. Um, and uh, Kevin Martin, who was one of my clients when I was an agent, uh, got me excited about the opportunity in Brisbane. And I decided to invest alongside Kevin in the bullets three or four years ago. And that, that's sort of where I've been. My experience has been as an investor, but it's also been as a team operator. Um, and through team operations, I've gotten experience uh, trying to win games and building uh, franchises on the sports direct side and also on the business side uh, where I've gotten involved in real estate development um, and, and sort of building brands around sports teams. Okay, nice. Now you said you were, you, you played back in the day. Were you a baller? Did you get buckets? I was more of a passer. Uh, <laughs> and, and I, I had more for a love for the game than it had for me. Um, <laughs> but, 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 uh, I still, you know, I still have a real passion for it and I enjoy the competition and, 
uh, you know, I'm still a huge, huge supporter of the game. Okay, nice. Jed, your time at, at Memphis, did you cross paths there with Chris Pongrass, the current CEO of the Sydney Kings? I brought Chris Pongrass to Memphis. Right. Um, the, the, the connection is that my sister lived in Australia for many years and her uh, closest friend was Chris's mom. Right. And so, and so our families knew each other. Chris reached out to me when I was running the Grizzlies and uh, that's how we connected. And uh, he was very persistent about wanting to get that experience in the NBA. And um, I think it was draft night of 2013 that he and I first spoke. Um, and then he came over and joined the Grizzlies and has, has done fantastic things. I'm really excited for him and proud of him. And I'm um, a big fan of Chris Bongrass. You were mentioning before um, the group. You, you were, um, were involved with Kevin Martin, your former client in coming to Brisbane. You were mentioning working in hand in hand with Jake Silverstein. What, can you tell us, I'm sure all the, the viewers and the listeners are really keen to know this, who exactly makes up the Brisbane Bullets ownership group. So we've got, so it's, it's Kevin started the group with myself. Uh, we joined forces three or four years ago. Um, we brought in a couple of NBA players, uh, former and current, including Chris Middleton, uh, who, who's, who's invested in the team. And, and Jake Silverstein is one of my dearest friends um, and a guy who I've partnered with in all kinds of investments, real estate, sport around the globe. Uh, and I persuaded him a year ago to join us in this. And he's super smart, uh, super engaged, and, and loves the game of basketball. And so Jake and I are the most active partners. Kevin is raising his family. Um, he's following it very closely, but he's not as active as he was at the start. Um, but we've got an interesting group also of people, Americans from who, who have Hollywood connections, who have technology connections, um, that have invested alongside us. Um, and we, we have really big aspirations for the Bullets. Uh, we're quite ambitious about how we see the long-term success of, of the club, um, its impact coming uh, towards the 2032 Olympics, um, and what Brisbane can be as, you know, its history around basketball, um, and really the whole NBL. So we're, we're excited to be a part of it, um, and we're an engaged and, and passionate ownership group. I'm keen to circle back around to that conversation around your vision for the club. Um, in a little bit. Before we do get there, now that we've got an understanding of, of who makes up the ownership group and where you and Jake and those guys sit amongst that, what and what what is the decision making process that is in place within the organization on high level matters uh, in terms of key positions within the club and and setting the strategy and the future moving forward? Well, listen. We've got a fantastic chief executive in Peter McClellan. So uh, Peter is someone who I've gotten to know the last three or four years. Um, he's got a breadth of experience in sport um, and he's very driven. He's very organized. He's a real leader. So all the key decisions run through Pete um, and Peter and I speak frequently. Jake and Peter speak quite frequently. I know Kevin talks to Peter as well. Um, and he gauges sort of uh, where ownership is on certain issues. But Peter is the guy on the ground who is, is really running the club. Um, and I think he, overall, he's doing a fantastic job so far in terms of laying the foundation for what we can become. So we're really happy to Peter. So that's that's sort of the decision-making process. On the basketball side, we've had, you know, when I got there with the club, we had Andre as the coach. He's a real legend, uh, a guy who, who I really enjoyed getting to know. Um, and he was with the club for quite some time. When he decided to depart, um, Peter and Kevin led a search uh, for a coach along with Sam uh, McKinnon. Um, and that led us to JD, who became our coach. Um, and most of the player decisions up until now, I have been between, I've really been at Sam's, Sam, Sam's leadership, um, talking with other people in the organization, the coach as well. Um, but he's been sort of driving the, the player personnel decisions. Okay. All right. Interesting. Because I feel like that at a number of clubs around the league, uh, when 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 push comes to shove, um, we there's a pretty clear kind of idea on the exterior about who holds the kind of key responsibility at the end of the day for those big decisions. You know, at the Sydney Kings, I think Paul Smith, when it push comes to shove, he says, "Look, I'm I'm the guy that holds that responsibility." Hutchie in Perth. 
uh, you, your old mate, Matt Walsh in New Zealand, I think would put his hand up and say, look, that's, that's me at the end of the day with, with the breakers. <laughs> Where do you think that sits within the bullets at this stage? I think it sits between uh, Jake, myself, and Peter um, at, in terms of the, the ultimate decision making. Uh, you know, we govern by consensus. Uh, we like to debate stuff. We like to bring, we brought Sam into that as well. Um, and we like to, you know, think it through. But up until now, I want to be clear up until this conversation, even the last week or two, I've been very hands off. I've been focused on my other businesses. I've been, waiting for Brisbane to, 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 to grow. And, and, uh, and I've been on the outside looking in. I wasn't involved in, in the coaching decisions up until now. I wasn't really involved in the player decisions, except at a very, very high level until now. Um, I got a little more involved when Aaron Baines became available and I knew people in common with him. And when Nathan Sobey, we could re re-sign him. But that was just, that was really just Peter and Sam uh, coming to Jake and I and saying, here's what we want to do. Um, and so I haven't been, I haven't, I've been nowhere nearly involved the way a Matt Walsh is or a Paul Smith has been um, or a Romy Chaudhary has been, uh, who's, who's one of my closest mates as well. Um, I, I've, I've been removed from that process. And where things are going on the basketball side now and what we've seen in the first part of this season, I think Jake and I have decided that maybe time for us to get more involved um, and for the first time and sort of figure out where we could put our, our fingerprints on the organization and on the team. All right. Well, so then that, that has all come as a result of what's been a really rough start to the season. We've just tipped over halfway and it's been, it's been nowhere near the ideal sort of start to the season that you guys would have liked. The, talk us through the decision that um, you guys as a club collectively made to part ways with James Duncan, my understanding, a, a year and a bit into what was a three-year deal. Yeah, I, I would say that, again, um, that was a decision that his hiring and his decision to part ways with him uh, was one that came to me um, with a recommendation and came to Jake and ownership with a recommendation that this was the right time to do that. Um, at first, we were a little bit resistant to that uh, because we felt like it was a short stint for James and we knew coming into it um, that he had not been a head coach for very long. And, we, you know, we were thinking more long term, um, but, you know, we, we supported the recommendation of management ultimately to make the change. Did you, I mean, no doubt you say you've been hands off, but no doubt you keep a close eye on how the team's progressing and take an interest in their games and the like. Of course, it was an 0-5 start after such a promising preseason and uh, bringing those key pieces into the mix that you spoke about, Baines, the re-signing of Nathan Sobey. Was there a conversation at that point, what that at, at 0 and 5 with the fever, you know, at, at when the sorry, not with the fever break that came later, but after an 0 and 5 start, why did you guys not make that decision then? I think there was a sense that we wanted to, they, I think the sense from management was that they wanted to see if JD could turn things around. That, you know, five games into a season is, is you know, still a very short period of time. Um, especially after a promising preseason, like you mentioned. Um, and we wanted to see where the opportunity would go. Um, you know, uh, so that, that, that was what, why the decision wasn't made after five games. Okay. I mean, I, I guess that there's a, a, an element of confusion for me, and I, I imagine some listeners and viewers there, because he went, they, the team went three and one after that point. And then that decision was made. It was a disappointing loss that one loss and those couple, couple of those wins were against the bottom team. The Illawarra Hawks were having uh, you know, a similarly uh, tough season. Um, it, it did feel like from the outside, maybe those steps forward were occurring. It did, did, did it, was it strange to you, the timing to then after three wins from four games to get that recommendation from management to say, we think it's best we move on from our current head coach? You know, I think from the outside, it, it may have felt a little strange. I think the feedback we were getting from people on the ground uh, and, and with the team was that they, that was something that needed to happen. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, in business and in life is that if you're entrusting people on the ground to, to help drive decisions and you're not there, you've got to, you know, take those recommendations very seriously. And, and you've got to have overwhelming 
confidence and evidence if you're going to overrule the decisions of, of your of your management team. Does your and Jake's increased level of involvement suggest maybe that confidence isn't at that desired level right now? No, what I would say is I think that um, as I mentioned, I think Peter's doing a fantastic job building this organization. He came in um, and he's driven real change with his leadership that is going to pay huge dividends for the Bullets for the next decade. Um, I think on the basketball side, uh, while we've been hands off, I think things have gone off the rails a bit and they haven't, they haven't reached our level of expectations. We want the Bullets to compete for championships. You know, we want, we want to be in the playoffs every year, in the finals. And that hasn't happened for years. It's not just this season. Um, and so I, th I do think that we're a little unique as an ownership group because we have real deep experience in the sport, um, you know, in, in making trades in signing free agents and running basketball teams. Um, and so I think it would be, uh, it, you know, it's helpful for us to get involved at this moment and say, well, why have things gone off the rails? Why have some of the personnel decisions we've made uh, not worked out? and consistently for several years. And how do we supercharge the bullets? Because I, I've watched this league and things can happen quickly. Teams can go from the bottom to the top rather quickly. And so, but we're not looking for a quick fix here. We're looking for uh, the right leadership that's gonna propel us forward uh, and, and be a consistent, consistently top performing club. The, the way things have played out, um, an interim coach has been replaced by an interim interim coach, which is not an ideal situation to have mid-season. I've spoken recently on air about how, how exhausting mentally and physically and emotionally that would be for the players. And, and, you, can, and you would have seen that on the floor when, when push came to shove and, and things got tough the other night, that the team just didn't feel like they had the energy to go with the Adelaide 36ers. If you guys had your time over again, would you have done that differently, putting Sam in as the GM of basketball into head coach and then the process of bringing Vandy in as the interim coach after that? Uh, no, I, you know, listen, I, I, I go back, harking back to my player agent days. I, I got involved in sports because uh, I love the competition and I love the game of basketball, certainly, but I just love the competition. And um, I see things from a player's perspective, you know, out of the gates because of my years as a player agent. And I will tell you, it's a major challenge to go into the season with one coach, to have an interim coach, to have another interim coach. It's, it's confusing. I think it's challenging culturally. It's not where we want it to end up. Uh, and frankly, I was surprised that it happened. You know, I thought we were, we were on a certain path, but, you know, this is a business of people and people have, uh, you know, their own ideas of, of, of what they want to accomplish. And uh, certainly that was not where we thought we were headed. Um, but um, I do believe that we're going to, we're going to course correct. Uh, we're going to get this on the real, right path moving forward. Um, and we're going to use our experience um, and, and our beliefs to, to, to sort of propel the club. You mentioned there that it's a, it's a business of people. The, a recent report from, from Matt Logue stated, and I quote his reporting, the relationship between McKinnon and chief executive officer, Peter McLennan has been described as tense and in some quarters, untenable uh, what's your response to that reporting and how would you describe that working relationship gosh i don't know if i how i describe it but if, if you had our record at any club in any professional sport i would hope there's some tension there <laughs> i would expect it because listen you know people need to you know lock arms together when things are, are challenging but this has been a really disappointing season for us and last season last season wasn't 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 what we wanted either so um, I, you know, those guys are hard charging guys who want to win um, and they want to build the organization the right way. Um, and so I would expect that when you're losing, tension comes out. And if it doesn't, you've got a bigger problem because I think that people uh, who are driven towards winning uh, feel that passion, feel that energy uh, and want to turn things around. With all these decisions being made, the decision to move on from James and to put Sam in and, and not one of the assistants and then to, for Sam to move back and for Vandy to come in as the interim head coach, have you and Jake or, or Kevin or any members of the ownership group met with the players at all? I know you're not on the ground, but, but over Zoom or anything along those lines to, to chat with them about the situation and these decisions? Jake, I know Jake has spoken to some of the players. 
Um, uh, you know, um, so there has been some dialogue there. Um, I think that um, that's important as part of this process. But, the, you know, clearly when we brought Sam in to be the interim coach, we, we didn't expect that he would leave, you know. Um, and that's, you know, that's, you know, wasn't what we expected or anticipated. Um, and, but, but, you know, now we're in a position where, you know, we want to fight to see if we can still make the plan. You know, and we also want to build something longer term that is that is really positive. So, uh, you know, we are where we are. We're looking forward. We want to make a really thoughtful decision about who our next full time coach is beyond the interim title. Um, I want to give a shout out to Greg because I think it's been really challenging the circumstances for him, and he's been a total pro from everything I hear and, and everyone on the ground that I talk to, um, and um, he's handled himself really really well. And so, and he's. He's been, you know, all about the bullets, all about the team. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been handed a challenging deck of cards. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I we, we have a lot of uh, appreciation and belief in what, what Greg is trying to do right now and, and the work that he's putting in. I think that's a great call because you know, that's a guy who wants to become a career coach, probably has, you know, head coaching, full-time head coaching aspirations in the future. So to step in and all of a sudden now, He's developing a reputation for what's taking place with this situation right now, but he's jumping onto a moving treadmill that's moving very, very quickly. Really, really tough situation. Yeah, and he's, listen, I've spoken with Greg before. I've met with Greg before. Um, you know, he's a really impressive guy. I think he's got a very bright future in coaching. Um, you know, this may be his moment to, to, to grab the bull by the horns um, uh, as a head coach. Um, and if it isn't, I think he's going to get other opportunities because I think he's, I think he's really impressive. That, that, that's my takeaway. That's what I, I felt from others in the organization who feel about him that way. Um, and it is a moving target. And we've got, listen, we've got some big personalities on the team. We've got some real veterans, veterans who expect to win, veterans who, who expect to achieve things, uh, which can be good. And when the season started in the preseason, there was a feeling that, you know, this club, this group could do something special, um, yeah, that we had some interesting pieces. And if they could come together and coalesce, the team could could really have a strong season. And that that hasn't hasn't happened over the first half of the year. I mentioned that report from Matt Logue. There's some comments last night from uh, Shane Hill on the basketball show saying that his understanding is that there were some conversations among the playing roster about whether or not to play against the Taipans in that recent game. That's how how bad they felt about the situation and all the moving pieces. It, uh, is is that what you've been hearing from from back here and and to, in, in reporting back to you guys that it got to that point? I hadn't heard that. I will tell you that we've got some really experienced professionals on the team. Um, I understand their frustration, um, and you know the the performances haven't been there. And you know everybody uh, takes responsibility for that. You know and should should own some of that responsibility. Um, but but as I said. Um, there's some real talent on this team um, and, and there, this things can turn around quickly in this sport. Um, I've seen it happen many times in my 25 years uh, in professional sport. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't count us out. Um, and I think this group's, I think this group may have hit rock bottom uh, with some of the challenges we faced. And sometimes when that happens, you can elevate quickly. And so um, if we can get this group playing the right way, um, I think the second half of the season can be, uh, much better than the first and, and much more back. What's the plan with the head coaching position moving forward in the short term and then, and then moving on from there? Uh, the, the short term is we want to support Greg and what he's doing. Um, you know, we want this group to have some uh, relationship building and stability from that. Um, and I think the long term is figuring out uh, you know, what the right path forward is, multi-season forward is. Um, you know, we had Andre here for a good chunk of years and there was a moment to pivot. Um, and like I said, I never interviewed JD. I wasn't involved in that process when he was chosen. I think that was Sam McKinnon leading it with Pete and, and Kevin. Um, but now we're at a moment in time where we want to be really thoughtful about it. And so uh, when we engage and decide who is going to be the long-term fit to be our head coach, um, and certainly Greg is someone that we're in discussion with uh, to do that. Um, but we're, we're looking around saying, where do we want the bullets to go? You know, what are the next three to five years gonna look like? How do we build the right identity on the court? 
um, and, and the right belief and the right culture. Um, and, and where's the leadership to do that? And that's, that's what's happening. That's what management's talking about. Um, management's talking to ownership about that. Um, and, and so that's, that's the process is, is to really try to get that decision right. Life comes at you fast when you have an, a losing season and, and there's not a lot to go in this regular season. I mean, it's really, what is it? It's start of Feb where the regular season wraps up. We're in late December right now. It's about six weeks away, the end of the regular season. So you said there you want to be thoughtful about the process of putting in place the next uh, head coach, whoever that may be. Does, does that suggest that Greg will probably coach out the rest of this season or is there still a chance a new head coach might come in in NBL 23? Yeah, we're, listen, that's going to depend on uh, our conversations with Greg, our conversations with the players, our conversations with management, um, and to talk through you know, what is going to propel this group forward in the short and long term. So we're open on that question because we want to get it right. And, uh, you know, we, we think we've got some real leadership uh, on the team um, and, and we're trying to think through what's, what's the right approach to take. It does come fast. This is a very short season and there's not a lot of time left. Um, but we're thinking about what's going to make us competitive this year, late in the season, um, because, you know, a few wins can change everything, right? Um, we run off three or four in a row and all of a sudden these conversations are very different. Um, but more than that, what is what is the long term future for the Bullets like as a basketball club, uh, and and what, what what do we want that team to look like? Well, let's talk about e- exactly that. What what, what is your and, and Jake and the ownership group's vision for the club moving forward? You, you spoke before about the the Olympics in in Brisbane and moving towards that. Um, no doubt that there's some grand plans in place in terms of the infrastructure around the club. What what is your vision? for the Brisbane Bullets in the immediate, the short and the long-term future? Uh, the immediate term future is that ownership is for the first time, uh, and I say that meaning Jake, myself, Kevin, and others uh, get a, more involved in, in figuring out how do we propel the team forward in a positive way? How do we touch on maybe some of our relationships in the NBA and around the globe to do that um, and to lean on people who we trust uh, to, to start moving things forward in a positive direction after several years of, of disappointing results. I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's been, okay. it's been disappointing since for the last several years and uh, we've been very hands-off and now thinking through how do we get more involved. Long-term, um, there's a real opportunity with, with the Bullets brand in Brisbane uh, to build a new arena, um, to make, create a, a new home for the Bullets uh, and a new entertainment precinct around that home. And that's something that we're spending a lot of time on, that Pete is spending a lot of time on. um, And we think that can propel the Bullets uh, to the top of the league in terms of uh, their impact in in their in their community. And that's 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 where we're headed long term. uh, And we've got our sights set on that as an ownership group. Peter has a sight set on that. um, But we certainly want to compete for titles. And and we're nowhere near that right now. Um, And so that's why. You we're starting to step in and think about uh, how do we how do we build something that, that that's more effective on the court. You spoke at the start of the conversation about what you do and your history and the like, and you talked about your property and your real estate interests. Is is that you, what you're alluding to there with the entertainment precinct? You trying to tie that all together in this process moving forward? Yeah, we think there's a big opportunity in Brisbane. We think there's a massive opportunity for the club. Uh, but also for the community to engage the community in basketball, um, to impact uh, more young people around the sport, um, to improve lives that way, to build re- lifelong relationships, uh, lifelong experiences among families and friends and others. I mean, this is you know an unbelievable opportunity to do that. And um, yes, th- there is an opportunity on the real estate side as part of that. Um, but you know, professional sports are about building communities and creating lifelong memories. Um, and uh, bringing communities together. And that's, that's what we're focused on in Brisbane. And that's what I've really been my lifelong passion uh, career-wise. Well, a big part of that is the, the fan experience. What, what is the experience like of being a fan and a member of the Brisbane Bullets? And this season, I think it's probably been pretty tough 
Um, and that happens sometimes with the teams that you go for. You know, I've been a lifelong Phoenix Suns fans and we had some tough times there for a little while. We were a winning team right now. I'm, a, I'm an Essendon Bombers fan. I'm not sure if you're across the AFL, but it's yep. been a tough trot for us. So as a Brisbane Bullets fan, since they came back in the league, I mean, no doubt you'll be aware of the history of that club, the three championships, how the, the, the title almost went through Brisbane when Leroy was there in, in the 80s. But the club has not won a playoff game since they returned to the league in 2016. And there's been volatility within the organization this season. What would be your message to the rusted on diehard Brisbane Bullet fans that turn up to Nissan Arena to cheer on this team on a weekly basis? I would say that we've got big ambitions for the club. Um, we're getting, uh, we're, we, we've invested in the club and bringing in guys like Aaron Baines, uh, guys like Tyler Johnson. Um, you know, this is a club on the rise uh, from where it was. Um, we've, you know, listen, we've got our season memberships are sold out. Um, the, the atmosphere um, has been terrific. Mm. And so, you know, I want to thank the supporters for that. We're going to grow our fan base, though. We're going to grow it in a major way because uh, we're going to start creating more of an identity, uh, more of a winning product. Um, and that starts now. And so I, that my message is, you know, stick with us, join us. Um, there's a lot of ambition in this group. Um, and we, we think we're headed to, to a very special place. And, and I think you're going to enjoy being part of that journey uh, and being a family member in that journey with us. Well, good luck with that, mate. Good luck. We talk about the short, Thanks, the man. medium, and the long term. Good luck getting back on the winning list in, in, in the next couple of weeks and, and keeping this season. I got a question for you. I got Hit a question me. for you, Liam. I'm here for it. You're a, big, you're a Phoenix Suns fan. When Adelaide went there and, and spanked them, we're, we're, how are you feeling about that? I was feeling amazing. I was, I was an Australian through and through that night. I wanted Jock Landau to have a great game. I wanted Tory Craig to play well as a Brisbane Bullets and Cairns Taipan alum but I wanted the Adelaide 36ers to get a big old win. So it was, it was party time. The cameraman who was with me the next day was complaining about his sore ribs. I was elbowing him so much. I was so excited about getting that win. I got to tell you, when Joe Ingles was playing, um, was he in Barcelona before he came to the NBA? I think that's he where he played went. for Barcelona. I think he was at Maccabi before he made that leap. Well, I tried to bring him from Barcelona to the Grizzlies. And I called him up and I, and I didn't understand the time difference. And I was running the Grizzlies. I called Joe on the phone and he had just, it was the night, the morning after his sister's wedding. And he was like, mate, I'm exhausted. We just had a big celebration here. My sister got married. I said, listen, we want to bring you to the Grizzlies. Um, and we had a long conversation um, and uh, we really wanted him to come. Um, and we just couldn't work out the details of his contract. And it's one of my biggest regrets. We wound up uh, when Joe passed, we couldn't get his agent on board with him coming to Memphis. Um, we Joe passed on us. Um, I don't know if he came to the NBA that season. I think he waited another year mm. and we wound up signing Mike Miller uh, for, for the, for the next year in, in that spot. Uh, but I followed Joe's career. It's been fantastic. Uh, he's an amazing guy. And it's one of my regrets when I was in the NBA is that we didn't get Joe to play for the Grizzlies. Wow. Cool story. He's back on the floor as of today, throwing yes. lobs and talking trash. Love it. I love it. Awesome, mate. Well, uh, as I said, good luck winning some games in this next little bit, keeping the season alive and, and all the best moving forward. Some big decisions to take place with the, with the coach, with the roster moving forward and how it's all going to go. So all the best bringing the bullets back to the prominence that they used to be in the NBL. Thanks, Liam. And don't, yeah, don't, don't sleep on us. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna turn this around. Okay. All right. Cheers. Take care.